to address big, sort of big issues related to our planet uh, and to One Health and One Welfare. Our last speaker of the afternoon is uh, Dr. Gabrielle Kaplan. Um, Dr. Kaplan uh, is a board certified medical doctor who trained in the United States at Columbia University and Johns Hopkins Hospital. As president of the of LifeWatch Group, an international think tank, she lectures internationally uh, for practical solutions to critical global issues. Uh, Dr. Kaplan's work has been acknowledged by Nobel Prize winners Linus Pollan, Mother Teresa, uh, Al Gore, and former U.S. President uh, Bill Clinton, and other presidents uh, from other world and other world leaders. She is widely published. I'm honored and thank the United Nations Environment, African Network for Animal Welfare, and the government of Kenya for giving me this opportunity to address simple, urgent, and practical moral solutions that will help us achieve a prosperous and sustainable future. In 2016, the majority of Nobel laureates, along with 15,000 of the world's top scientists signed a letter warning that at our present population growth, civilization risks collapse by 2040 because our planet has already surpassed the tipping point for human sustainability. Now, all life is facing man-made sixth extinction. Today, I will address two key issues that will help avoid these predictions provided we act now. These are number one, family planning, and number two, the food we eat. This graph shows human population growth from the time of Christ with the projections of the planet's carrying capacity. As we can see here, medical innovations have decreased checks and balances while agricultural, genetic, and industrial development have increased food production, allowing us to thrive. But this growth has consumed natural resources, making our future unsustainable. Population growth is creating environmental and wildlife destruction at the pace nature can't restore. Increased competition for food, water, shelter, and jobs has forced many to migrate and others to war. Note in the graph how wars cause baby booms. Population growth increases competition, leading to poverty, hunger, crime, drugs, and joblessness, causing social and economic environmental degradation that this graph shows. To stem this trend, we must achieve socioeconomic stability. This NASA photo shows night lights from only 40% of today's 7.6 billion people, as 60% have no electricity. Over the next 30 years, 2 billion more are expected to be born which will further deplete resources unless we practice birth control. Human activities cause climate change, which precipitates storms, floods, droughts, fires, erosion, and pollution, decimating economies, habitats, and wildlife. For example, in 2017, a hurricane devastated Puerto Rico. A year later, the majority of services Structures, jobs, schools, etc. have not been restored, although it is part of the United States. So, for the afflicted, civilization ended. At these rates, these environmental disasters will increase. So, if the USA can afford to restore Puerto Rico, how can poorer nations afford future disasters? It is because of this that predictions of civilization ending are real and must be urgently addressed.
Competition for jobs and resources spits people against each other, leading to racism, intolerance, and even war. Yemen, Uganda, and Miramar are examples. War and ethnic cleansing in stressed areas are forcing millions to flee. So it is not far-fetched to see how, in 20 years, civilization could end. How can we avoid such a fate? The first key is family planning. China enacted a law limiting one child per family, and by doing so, became the second largest economy in the world. But China's policy encouraged aborting girls so many men can find wives now. This coercive law created selfish, spoiled children because they had no brothers or sisters to keep them in check. Recently, China ended the one-child law because the government believed that the nation's social security funds were dwindling due to decreasing labor. This reversal is increasing its population, which will worsen its present 5.5% unemployment, adding to social woes. Top economists determined that the funds were decreasing because they were invested in low-yield investments. Thailand, too, embraced birth control, but did it without coercion. This pulled the country out of poverty, and now Bloomberg rates Thailand as the happiest economy in the world for several years in a row. Let's watch how Thailand did that. Now, when I was a young man 40 years ago, the country was very, very poor, with lots and lots and lots of people living in poverty. We decided to do something about it. But we didn't begin with a welfare program or a poverty reduction program, but we began with a family planning program following a very successful maternal child health activity, sets of activities. So basically, no one would accept family planning if their children didn't survive. So the first step, get to the children, get to the mothers, and then follow up with family planning. Not just child mortality alone, you need also family planning. Now let me take you back as to why we needed to do it. In my country, that was the case in 1974. Seven children for family, tremendous growth at 3.3%. There was just no future. We needed to reduce the poverty and growth rate. So we said, let's do it. The women said, we agree, we'll use pills. But we needed doctors to prescribe the pills and we had very, very few doctors. So we didn't take no as an answer, we took no as a question. What do we do for the other 80%? Leave them alone and say, well, they're not medical personnel? No, we decided to do a bit more. So we went to the ordinary people that you saw, and they were terrific, and they practiced their family planning themselves. So they could supply pills and condoms throughout the country, in every village of the country. So there we are. We went to the people who were seen as the cause of the problem to be the solution. So wherever there were people, and you can see most of the women, selling things, here's the floating market, selling bananas and crabs and also contraceptives. Wherever you find people, you will find contraceptives in Thailand. And then we decided, why not get to religion? And Thai people were Buddhists, so we went to them and they said, look, could you help for the monk to sprinkle holy water on pills and condoms for the sanctity of the family? And this picture was sent throughout the country. So some of the monks in the villages were doing the same thing themselves. And the women were saying, no wonder we have no side effects. It's been blessed. <laughs> that was their perception. And then we went to teachers. You need, you need everybody to be involved in trying to provide whatever it is that makes humanity a better place. So we went to the teachers, over a quarter of a million were taught about family planning with new alphabet, A, B for birth, C for condom, I for IUD, V for vasectomy. Again, education plus entertainment. And their kids were doing it in schools too. We had relay races with condoms. We had children's condom blowing championship. And before long, the condom was known as the girl's best friend. We introduced our first microcredit program in 1975. And women who organized it said, we only want to lend 
to women who practice family planning. If you're pregnant, take care of your pregnancy. If you're not pregnant, you can take a loan out from us. And that was run by them, and after 35, 36 years, it's still going on. It's part of the Village Development Bank. It's not a real bank, but it's a fund, microcredit. And we didn't need a big organization to run it. It was run by the villagers themselves, and you've probably hardly seen a Thai man there. It's always women, 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 women. And what happened? And all this thing, from seven children to 1.5 children. And so that's the case of everyone joining in. We ha didn't have a strong government. We didn't have lots of doctors. But it's everybody's job who can change attitude and be. And after I gave them statistics, they said, yes, OK. You can use all the radio stations, television, everyone. And we said the public, uh, institutions, religious institutions, schools, everyone was involved, starting from university. And these are high school kids teaching high school kids. And the best teachers were the girls not the boys. And then we went down one more step. These are primary school kids, third, fourth grade, going to every household in the village, every household in the whole of Thailand, giving AIDS information and a condom to every household given by these young kids. And no parents objected because we were saved and trying to save lives. And this was a lifesaver. And then we gave condoms up everywhere in the streets, everywhere, everywhere. In taxis, you get condoms. And also in traffic, the policemen give you condoms, our cops and rubbers program. And then, you know, new change. We had hairband, clothing, and the condom for your mobile phone during the rainy season. I gave this to El Gore and to Bill Senior also. Stop global warming, use condoms. And then this is the picture that I mentioned to you that the weapon of mass protection. And let the next Olympics save some lives. <laughs> Why just run around? There was political commitment, some financial commitment, and everybody joined the fight. So just don't leave it to the specialists, the doctors and nurses. We all need to help. And then we decided to help people out of poverty, this time not with government alone, but in cooperation with the business community. Because poor people are business people who lack business skills and access to credit. Those are the things to be provided by the business community. We're trying to turn them into barefoot entrepreneurs, little business people. The only way out of poverty is through business enterprise. So that was done. So the money goes from the company into the village via tree planting. So it's not a free gift. They plant the trees, and the money goes into their microcredit fund, which we call the Village Development Bank. Everybody joins in, and they feel they own the bank because they brought the money in. And before that, you can borrow the money. You need to be trained. And we believe if you want to help the poor, those who are living in poverty, access to credit must be a human right. Access to credit must be a human right. Otherwise, they'll never get out of poverty. And then before getting a loan, you must be trained. Here's a, what we call a barefoot MBA, teaching people how to do business so that when they borrow money, they'll succeed with the business. So these are some of the business, mushrooms, crabs, uh, vegetables, trees, fruits. And then now, finally, in education, we want to change the school as being underutilized into a place where it's a lifelong learning center for everyone. We call this our school-based integrated rural development, and it's a center, a focal point for economic and social development. So redo the school. Make it serve the community needs ground so they raise their own vegetables. And then finally, I firmly believe if we want the MDGs to work, the Millennium Development Goals, we need to add family planning to it. Of course, child mortality first, and then family planning. Everyone needs family planning service. It's underutilized. So we have now found the weapon of mass protection. And then finally, that is our network, and these are our Thai tulips. This is when there was no contraception in Thailand in 1940. And look at Bangkok in 2017, the same city. It puts it in the world stage of prominent cities, prosperous and educated. Look at the World Bank's graph. It shows from 1940 to 2015 the exponential growth of export economy that Thailand has achieved. This line represents the export data of all other nations combined. Nations that practice family planning are prosperous, educated, have low infant mortality, and have time to enjoy life. 
For every dollar invested in contraception, seven dollars are saved. Religions that don't accept contraception have also natural family planning methods that work. To quickly educate the importance of family planning, Thailand provided free contraception and used the media to educate without legislation or expensive programs. The United States-based organization called Population Media airs popular radio and TV soap operas in over 50 countries, causing constructive change to nations who permit their programs. Now we go to point number two of this lecture. The number two point is how to achieve sustainability is by the food we eat. The United States' number one expenditure is health care. Its top expenses are cardiovascular, cancer, diabetes, Alzheimer's, immunological diseases. These diseases are caused or are exacerbated by a diet based on animal products and processed foods, according to the International Academies of Sciences. According to the World Health Organization, eating animal products and processed foods are more harmful than tobacco. Proof of this is that in 2018, only 7 million died from tobacco worldwide. However, over 20 million died from animal-based and processed diet type foods. Therefore, a vegetable-based diet without processed foods will stop and in some cases cure these ailments. Brief summary of this key factor can be read in the book The China Study and the documentary video Forks Over Knives. The United States-based Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics recommends a vegetable non-processed food diet to all except infants who should only drink mother's milk. The World Health Organization shows that about 60% of deaths from chronic disease are avoided by this diet. President Clinton, after a heart attack and cardiac bypass, followed this diet and feels terrific. You look wonderful. You look better than I've ever seen you in my life. So when you and I had to have our heart operations because of blockage, we know we didn't have enough to consume whatever it was we were consuming and right. live however we were living before then. So I changed my diet to try to drastically cut down on my cholesterol intake so this would never happen again. Mike Tyson is still fighting to change his life. I lost weight. I dropped over 100 pounds, but um, yeah, I just felt like changing my life, doing something different. And so I became a vegan. And um, becoming a vegan, it gave me another um, opportunity to live a healthy life. And I was just horrible. I was so congested from all the drugs and bad cocaine. I could hardly breathe, high blood pressure, almost dying, and arthritis. And once I became a vegan, all that stuff, um, yeah, diminished. I, too, followed this diet because my family history of strokes and heart attacks convinced me to do so. My father, although he was a vegetarian, died with severe arteriosclerosis because he ate processed foods. To avoid his fate, I became a vegetarian and stopped processed foods. In about six months after starting this diet, I lost 25 pounds. My cholesterol and pre-diabetic problems disappeared without medication. Now, I am 71 years old and I feel healthy thanks to this diet. Vegetarians who eliminate processed foods will not have strokes, heart attacks, or type 2 diabetes as long as they follow this diet. This diet cures impotence, esophagogastric reflux, acidity, constipation, and many allergies as well as immune diseases. Patients who follow this regime and are under medical care will arrest, improve, and even reverse some of the cases of osteoporosis, Alzheimer's, and cancers. Why don't doctors want us to know about it? Because healthy patients don't visit doctors.
Let's review details of this diet. It eliminates meat, fish, seafood, poultry, milk, eggs, and processed foods. It saves money and it doesn't require counting calories. You can eat as much as you like without gaining weight. However, it requires you take daily vitamin B12 complex pills, which do not require a prescription. These foods are the staples of this diet. Legumes, meaning beans, grains, fruits, tubers, leafy greens, cruciferous vegetables, brown rice, whole wheat, corn, beans, potatoes, sweet potatoes, quinoa, lentils, peas, whole wheat bread, whole wheat pasta, pita bread, whole wheat or corn tortillas, falafel, hummus without oil, etc. No-nos to this diet are all fats, including olive oil, milk, eggs, soft drinks, artificial sweeteners, smoothies, cookies, white bread, and white pasta. Because these are using enriched flour, they are processed. Also, you must not eat candies, dry fruits, jams, all nuts, and tofu. Processed foods include white rice, white sugar, white bread, and all enriched foods. Years ago, Josvat Ngonyo, president of ANAW from Kenya, came to lecture at the Cleveland Zoo. After his talk, the veterinarian toured the zoo and pointed at a gorilla that used to be obese, diabetic, had high cholesterol, had liver problems, and had hypertension because he was fed processed diet. Once they fed him foods gorilla eat in the wild, he became healthy and is now a handsome gorilla, showing that even primates are affected by this diet for they are genetically related to humans. Food Production and Habitats Raising animals for human consumption uses 40% of the world's land and 50% of the grain produced goes to feed livestock. World hunger would stop if instead we would feed humans these grains. By doing so, habitat destruction would decrease immensely. Why do farmers prefer raising livestock? Because these are more profitable. Growing populations require more food, and since animal products are popular, more forests and wild habitats are cleared for these growing needs. Since forests cleanse about 30% of CO2, the deforestation animal products cause cancel out the goals of the Paris Climate Accord. To raise animals for food, wells and aquifers are drying because these require enormous amounts of water. While Vegetable crops, on the other hand, use a fraction of water. Wildlife and human population growth. As we worry about our own survival, some ask, why should we worry about conserving wildlife and habitats? Because we depend on nature. And if we destroy it, we destroy ourselves. The journal Science and the United Nations reports show the cost-benefits ratio of global conservation of natural habitats and protecting the wildlife is at least a hundred to one. They point out that by the year 2050, allowing wild lines to be transformed into farms or towns would diminish global economic output by 18%. So it is in our best interest to conserve nature. Here are some examples. About 75% of crops depend on bees and pollinators. Corals and plankton contribute 75% of the world's oxygen and provide habitats. Yet, we destroy these by raising more animal crops that in turn destroy our health, economy, and the environment. Growing populations encroach habitats, displacing wildlife to irreparable degree. This explains why experts warn that at the present rate, humanity and most species will face extinction by the end of the century unless we address this 
with war times speed. The name we give to this extinction is called the Anthropocene extinction because this extinction is caused by men. Wise nations who value nature, for example, Japan, encourages building high rises to protect habitats. There is a trend to use roofs of skyscrapers to plant crops, decreasing the farming footprint and cleansing the metropolitan air. Land grabs and justice. Beware of foreign countries and multinationals that are making deals with governments to use land for logging, mining, and farming. This is forcing many farmers to leave their lands who often are not compensated. Other farmers flee due to global warming, adding to social dislocation and growing poverty. Why is Thailand protected farmers, taught them to improve farming techniques, making them prosperous and happy? Climate change and human activities. Conservation, recycling, and shifting to clean, renewable energy in order to avert environmental changes are key. But these pale if we do not address birth control and diet. Farm animals, food processing, and the healthcare industry are the top causes of CO2 emissions, more so than manufacturing and automotives. The National Academy of Sciences calculated that plant-based diets can reduce CO2 emissions by 70% saving 1.6 trillion annually. Project Drawdown compares the efficiency of 100 factors that can restore the climate. These concur with us and show that adding methods to avoid food waste will save up to 74 trillion in about 30 years. Global warming is melting glaciers, drying rivers and streams, and devastating water supplies. At the present rate, Sea levels will rise, displacing about 2 billion people in the next decades, which will be devastating to us all. Glacial melt is a significant contributor to sea level rise, one of the biggest threats climate change presents to modern civilization. We may already be locked into three feet of sea level rise, enough to submerge hundreds of millions of people worldwide. Climate change can often be an abstract concept, making it tough for world leaders to justify the type of policy changes necessary to curb the emission of greenhouse gases. Personal and international cooperation. Men of all species succeeded by its ability to cooperate and share knowledge. So urgent worldwide cooperation is key to preventing the catastrophic changes the United Nations IPCC reports tell us we face. The problem is that the majority of people are unaware of these dangers, so urgent education via the media will resolve this gap. Because we must work as a world family for these key points to succeed, nations who refuse to implement these practical solutions must have their products slapped with carbon tariffs by the rest of nations in order to mitigate the damage they cause. Wealth, hunger, and peace. In summary, we have been warned that civilization will collapse in about 20 years. How can people help themselves if they don't know this? How can they prevent this catastrophe if no one tells us how? It is up to us to alert and provide hope for we do have the knowledge and resources to prevent this by harnessing the mass media to alert everyone while we still have time. The solutions are simple and economical. Number one, birth control, and number two, non-processed vegetarian diet. These will make us prosperous, healthy, and lead us to a hopeful future, a future where we can share a world in which we can live in harmony, dignity, and peace, a place we can all call home.
This satellite photo of NASA was published a week ago. It shows how the world is now on fire. How will it be then in 20 years from now? We have no time to spare. Let's not face the day when our grandchildren, surrounded by devastation, ask us, if you knew about this, why didn't you do something while there was still time? Why didn't you tell us how to avoid all this? I'll be happy to answer questions. Thank you.